house fire, I almost drowned. And I remember as the water put me down the dark below the ice above, I cold, I calm, I quiet it was. And I realized how easy it would be. Death was something that could happen to me. And as I stumbled home, newly informed, I walked into the future warm. The song says, when I was five, I almost drowned. It's really when I was four. Loveless match, the hound death seeps in like a slow, steady hemorrhage. Suffering death from conformity. Saw death in the life that was expected of me. Wasn't any stronger, just more scared. Wasn't any smarter, just a little more aware. Oh, what? It's around the corner. What? Where's down the hall? It don't cry, don't need no mourner. It's right here, right now. I think a healthy sense of mortality is a good thing. So stupid when I slip in the bitterness. So stupid when I settle for emptiness. So stupid when I keep myself from loving you. I'm so stupid cause I kill myself when I do. When I let the cold water pull me down. When I don't even notice that I'm starting to drown. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, what? Who's around the corner, what? I think a healthy sense of mortality, you know, helps you not uh, waste, your, waste your life. I grew up in uh, St. Louis and uh, I loved writing. I loved reading. I'd lock myself away in my room and just read book after book after book and I'd write short stories and uh, it wasn't until I was about probably 14 or 15 that I really started listening a lot to uh, rock and roll and then it just kind of took me over so I decided I'd start writing songs and that whole troubadour thing you know you get to play them for an audience you know and uh, get approval in the park my friend Mark holds his father's five iron high waiting for a thunderstorm that gathers in the sky I lose my nerves so I observe a safe distance away lightning crashes nothing happens we survive another day and a lot of my music deals with uh, darker things but sort of hopefully coming through those darker things to a better place he would come along he was big and strong got me by the throat he had a really bad temper must be bad I must be guilty for my dad don't want to come in. what's important is whether it's honest and true pages turn time goes on now I'm older I write songs some of them about my father and me my mom says if I tell it will kill my dad as well and his death will be my responsibility I'm still bad I'm still guilty because my dad wanted to kill me. I don't think when you deal as honestly as you can with something, that it's, it's ever negative. Past my guarded walls, down my long dark halls, there's a big locked door, but you have the key. But you have the key. Went to uh, the University of Missouri, and then I, uh, Headed off uh, for a year to Chicago, trying to figure out whether to go to L.A. or New York. And uh, I was doing acting also, and I went to L.A. And acting went pretty well for me in L.A., but I wasn't very happy. So, packed up the car, moved to New York. I'll give no confession of this long slide, this procession of events too damn dull to recount. From the youthful and quick to the useless old prick whose back rent is all he can amount. Hey, you know, I'd always had this dream ever since I was about 15 or 16 of getting to see this guy at, um, who was a real famous talent scout at CBS Records, John Hammond. And he'd signed people all the way back from Billy Holiday and Benny Goodman and Count Basie all the way up through Dylan and Springsteen and Stevie Ray Vaughan. I had just started working at a restaurant in downtown. Uh, Manhattan in the village and a guy came in reading John Hammond's autobiography and I said oh, you're interested in John Hammond 
And he said, well, my name's Lincoln Clapp, and I'm an engineer. I, I work with John Hammond. We just did a, uh, I did the Steve Ray Vaughan albums, you know, with him and stuff. And so Lincoln gave me the number and said, you know, but he's got this secretary who's, you know, you got to get past her, and they also screen a lot of calls and stuff. And so I called, and she happened to be out of town, and he picked up the phone, and we we really hit it off on the phone. And so I came in uh, using the pretense that I was a big fan of his, and I wanted him to sign his autobiography for me. And then I said, you know, well, you know, Mr. Hammond, it had always been my, I am a songwriter, and it had always been my dream that you'd hear my music. And he goes, well, I figured that. You know, why don't you just uh, come by Friday? And I said, well, you'd like me to drop off a tape? And he goes, no, no, just bring your axe. So I, I brought my guitar and uh, played two songs. And, he, and then he like stopped me and asked me a couple questions, said, play one more. And then I, at the end of like three songs, he just stood up behind his desk, started making phone calls and saying, I found uh, the best new songwriter I've heard in years. We must do a record deal immediately. It was like out of a, like a Busby Berkeley musical or something, you know, it was like, it was goofy. Today, despite his recent setbacks due to ill health, Hammond is still taking chances. Not many people know Ned Massey, but he's about to make his national debut. Will Massey be another Dylan? Another Springsteen? John Hammond has given his nod of approval. One of the real problems about the record business nowadays, I think, and this may be a minority point of view, is they don't take chances anymore. Mr. Hammond just wanted to do an album that would be basically solo acoustic, you know, very sparse, didn't want it, and wanted to hook me up eventually with like a good guitar player or something, but to play for a, a while and let the sound that I would do evolve. He didn't want to force anything on it. If I knew something about opera, I would sing you an aria By some guy named Giuseppe for some chick named Maria But I know nothing about that, so let's just set up for this It's the best I can do to go along with this Kiss on your lips Coming straight from my heart With a love so fine It can only be described as art I call it art And uh, we were in the studio one day and uh, he had this massive stroke and the head of A&R effectively killed the contract. I got involved with a management contract. Uh, I went along with their ideas, but they were the ones who were supposed to know better, not me. And instead of what Mr. Hammond wanted to do, which was essentially me being a solo acoustic artist and slowly build the music around me, these guys put a big band around me, threw me in the studio, and we did a big showcase, and it was all a big disaster. And I was downright bad, and it just didn't work. So uh, all the labels just kind of went, well, you know what? We don't hear it. So uh, then this management company had this big meeting. And there was like a semicircle of like about eight people around me, from investors and management people and stuff. And one person said something like, well, you know, we need to focus here. And another person goes, yeah, we, we hear you being sort of like Paul Simon. I know you think I'm a crazy old bitch. And then another person said, yeah, but we also hear you kind of being like Bon Jovi. Look to me if you're looking for perfection No, oh, my baby, I can hold that erection I'm no monster, I'm no saint No single person you can paint And then another person, this is absolutely true Another person said, well, you know, yeah It's like, kind of like a cross between Paul Simon and Bon Jovi These are all the pertinent details These are all my messages to me You know what? This is sounding terrible Uh, I, uh right then just said you know what I've really gotten myself into a mess here things people have said things 
people have done Get inside of my head before I've even begun Makes me mad that I've wasted time Letting my stories mess with my head These are all the pertinent details These are all my messages to me Here it is, the garbage and the grill It's a mess, but it's making sense to me so uh, I wanted out of my contract and they wouldn't let me out of my management contract so I had to sit out for about a, I think it was a year and a half and not do anything with my music. And a lot of time chasing the words to say the way I feel for you. So from better or worse, I hope these few will do when I say I love you. Yes, I Back when everything was happening with John Hammond, I had a uh, gig in the village, and there was a woman playing in the village. People kept saying, oh, you've got to hear this woman play. People kept telling this woman, oh, you've got to hear Ned play. She had a... Uh, some people coming up from Nashville to hear her play. And that was a day where I had a show. So she called the club and the club contacted me and said, can this woman do 20 minutes before your show tonight? She has some people in town who want to showcase. And I said, sure. And uh, I had heard some of her music, little home demos that she had done. And to be honest, I, I, was, I did not like her music that much. And uh, her name was Terry Radigan. And she got off stage and came over and she asked me about the tape and I very arrogantly and stupidly said something about, you know, the, the reverb on her drum sounds or some kind of some kind of stupid comment that really wasn't applicable to a home recording situation. And pretty much made an ass out of myself. And she thought I was an ass. And uh, so that was back around the time I was working with John Ammon, and then about uh, four or five years later, Terry called me saying, I asked this woman for a recommendation for a voice coach. She said, I should talk to you. And I said, why don't we get, to get together for lunch? This was the woman who thought I was an ass and whose music I didn't like. So we got together for lunch and hit it off. And um, then uh, we started dating. And after a week of dating, I said, you know, I, I remember very vividly saying, you know, Wow, this is really weird. This is like uh, this is like a person I think I could marry. Hundred million molecules scattered out in space across a hundred million miles together in one place. And from the day that we were born, they were leading to a kiss. So oh, tell me what. Chances are of this. Yeah, we are inescapably, inextricably intertwined, caught up in the mystery. Someone explain to me how everything could be a hundred million accidents happening so perfectly. It just happened to be you and me. Uh, I'd never thought in my life that I was going to date, much less live with a songwriter. Now I can't imagine being with anyone other than Terry. We're just really good with each other's music. Uh, we both really understand it, and uh, we may not take each other's advice, but we really value each other's uh, opinions and, and really hardly ever play anything without playing it for each other first. And so it's really great to have that. This is the place where God resides, and if we turn our backs and close our eyes, we deny grace in our lives. It 
there were people at labels who liked my music, who wanted me to keep recording, um, so they would give me development deals. And you know, at one one the guy left the label. Another one, uh, another guy gave me a development deal. When he gave it to me, he said, "I just want to see you keep recording. I can't sign you because I just signed another you know male singer songwriter, so I can't sign." Another, you know, it was that kind of thing. And I knew what was happening was I was getting obsessed in a bad way. Couldn't get, uh, couldn't get the record deal. The record deal, you know. And uh, I was sort of becoming obsessed by it all, getting a record deal, and uh, becoming kind of an unhappy person. It's only a panic And that's not what music's about, and that's not what it should be about. For a while in New York, I was living in a little hellhole studio that was in an artist building in Soho. And mine was a little tiny room that I inhabited with about 3,000 huge water bugs who didn't pay any rent. And uh, there was only one window in the room, and it looked out on the interior shaft of a building. So I never got any direct sunlight. And it was an overcast day, and uh, Sunday. And I got the idea for Patrick O'Doherty, and uh, started writing it probably at around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and finished, I think, at 6 or 7, and just had no idea that the time had passed. Patrick O'Doherty settled in Belfast City with a brand new name and a burning desire. He was hot paid and protected, revered and respected, for he was the man who could give the people fire. And for the British troops, he did not care, but he made his fellow rebels swear his handiwork would not be used on innocent lives. And then one day he heard the news, a car bomb near a Protestant school. At least a dozen passers-by wounded or dead. He ran and found the rebel commander, grabbed him and demanded an explanation. But this reply was all he got instead. Are you really so naive that you could honestly believe that in Belfast there's such a thing as innocent lives? Patrick said, keen for your mother country. Wow. Thank you, wherever that came from. From the beginning, of just writing it, you know, the whole experience was just great. I'm, I'm so happy I, uh, that I have something in my life that, uh, you know, uh, that I do, that I'm, I'm that passionate about, you know. I mean, it, it's, it thing, I think it's what everybody wants in their life, is, is something, it, it are things to be passionate about. I'm smarter than that. Men on the joke I see through the smoke. Terry had stuff happening for her in Nashville. She had an opportunity to make an album through a publisher she was working with. And so we moved down here to Nashville for what was going to be like three or four months. Her publisher was dropped as a division of MCA Publishing so then the album wasn't recorded. And then we decided just to stay down here. Uh, there was, I, I just, at that point, I was just tired of New York, and I was tired of um, just everything that was going on. Wish I wasn't so smart Wish that I could lead with my heart Right on my sleeve. I wish that I still be. And I was working as a, a waiter. And the places where you can make money as a waiter were places that were uh, frequented by music industry people and uh, who all knew who Terry was. And many of uh, those same people knew 
uh, knew me through Terry. And uh, but, but didn't well, 99% of them didn't know me as a songwriter. They just knew of me as Terry's boyfriend. And so here's this artist they all love, Terry Radigan and her waiter boyfriend. I am ambiance. I can pirouette or play the dunce. Affect a flirt with the lonely skirt or make it seem to the queen he's what I want. But I just want my tip before I lose my grip. Oh, come back again, oh how close you all came Your throats were at my fingertips But we all know what I wouldn't do To be just as big a bourgeois pig as you Living here in Nashville at one point, I got so depressed, you know, working in restaurants and things seemingly not happening with my music that I gave myself pneumonia just through depression. Beyond venue. And that was that was probably the thing that turned me around more than anything and just said like, you know, just that none of this stuff matters. You know? Uh, I just gotta keep doing good work and, and hopefully I'll get the opportunity for people to hear it. Ooh, help me see. How easily I could be standing in the mess of the mistakes I made Shaking my fist, searching for blame Smashing at the mirror as my vision fades All I can say is, no way man I don't want to end up an angry old white Cursing at the world, passing me by And looking back sad, forward right Say goodbye to the lie of the angry old white man I don't want to end up an angry old white man All right then it's like when the story of who you are becomes who you are. You know, I was the guy who almost got the record deal, had all the fame and everything, and then and I found myself just starting to like be that story. You know, first you speak, then you learn to spell, finally you get your own story to tell. Talking about John Hammond, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great story, but that's not what I should make my music about. Oh God. Heard all the fools like me squander so recklessly his gifts. The gift you most certainly are, my girl. Losing you would be losing the world, as I know. There was a relative through marriage of Terry's, a guy named John Massere from Brooklyn, New York, who wanted to start a publishing company. After a period of a couple of years, it, we finally put it together, and um, that's uh, the label I'm on down here, Punch Records, and, and put out my album, and they're my publisher. We did this uh, album on a pretty small budget, and uh, there are a few tracks on here where I am just about absolutely perfectly happy with how they came out. The easy thing for me to say at this point would be, oh, it, yeah, it's all happened for the best and everything. Uh, you know, a year from now, if my album hasn't done well and maybe Punch Records isn't around anymore and I might not have any immediate opportunities for my music, you know, something like that would happen. 
you know, well then what do you say, you know? Oh, yeah, this has all been for the best. You know, I don't know if it's been for the best or not for the best. It's just been how it's been. So you just have to love it for what it is and, and, and try not to ascribe too many positive or, or negatives to it because then it's a trap I think you can fall into. It's just what is. So you just have to, like, be happy with it and, and not... Not get caught up too much in that story. Seems like everything I have Seems like everything I need Seems to slip right through my hands Seems to slip away from me When it seems I'm getting closer Ends up all I really know Is one more day I've gotten older To learn and to let go I am learning to let go I am learning to let go I am learning I am learning At least right here, right now At least I get to hold you tight And if that's all I'm allowed Maybe that's all right It's just sort of part of this this path, you know, we're working as hard as we can, doing doing the best work we can. I, I think happiness is is, is is kind of a, in our society, is kind of an overrated thing. Like we're supposed to be happy or content or things like that. And I don't I don't think an artist should be happy or, or content. So I I renounce bland happiness. Well, I am thankful for the morning. I'm grateful for the day. Cause I know how without warning It all can slip away How the strongest of faith Can be tested, can be tried Sometimes I wonder If I have that strength inside So I am thankful for the mortar I am grateful for the day To put my house in order to keep the storms at bay well, the walls are nothing fancy Cause I'm learning as I build This house is nothing pretty But it comforts me still To be living here in this house of faith Brick by brick, stone by stone This plain old house becomes a home So, you know, I, I just think, you know, happiness shouldn't be your goal, doing what you what you want to do should be your goal and, and doing what you're supposed to do in this life is, is your goal and so that you feel you have as few regrets as possible and feel used up at the end. That's it. Don't make me laugh like you don't crawl Like you got some answer to it all This hurt and pain, the only fact in the fiction Take confusion and embrace a contradiction Pounding rocks, pounding skin Bound to make the same mistakes again Think twice, but not long Think too much, and your life is gone Yeah, you rear your mirror Take a look back, what brought you here Rear view mirror Things are closer than they appear In the rear view mirror Forget the name, remember the face Strike a match, torch the place